Grub2 is the default bootloader and manager for Ubuntu Linux. It is a descendant of legacy Grub which stands for the Grand Unified Bootloader. Grub2 brings major improvements and significant configuration changes to Ubuntu Linux, in comparison to its predecessor, Legacy Grub. When a computer is powered on, it first assembles CMOS settings in its BIOS and initiates a power on self-test, or post. After reading these settings and performing the post, control is then transferred to the master boot record, or MBR. Once control passes to the MBR, it will either load a bootloader install within its storage space or initialize a bootloader on a separate partition it points to that has been marked as active. Control then passes to the bootloader, in this case Grub2. If there is only one operating system on the computer, it initializes, reads its configuration files, and begins to load the Linux kernel automatically. If there is more than one operating system, Grub2 will present a menu to the user and allow them to choose the operating system they wish to boot into. The default operating system and timeout values can be changed within the Grub2 configuration files. Once the Linux kernel loads, Grub2 is no longer active, and the kernel then initializes the system by loading daemons into memory. The first of these daemons is the init, daemon. It loads all the other daemons necessary to bring the system up to a usable and productive state. To summarize Grub2's changes and improvements over the original legacy Grub. 1. A new configuration file structure. 2. Scripting support. 3. Dynamic module loading. 4. Rescue mode. 5. Themes. 6. Graphical boot menu with splash capability. 7. The ability to boot ISO images directly from the hard drive. 8. Non-X86 platform support. 9. Universal support for UUIDs. 10. Internationalization and non-ASCII character support. For this triple boot setup, we partitioned a 500GB hard drive and a laptop with an MBR partition table. The first partition was formatted as a Mac journal file system. The second partition was a Windows 7 system. The third was a Windows 7 NTFS OS partition. Finally, we made the last partition extended and created three logical DOS drives. One was EXT4 Linux for Ubuntu, two was a Linux swap partition, and three was an NTFS data partition. The operating systems were installed in the following order. First, Snow Leopard. Second, Windows 7. Third, Ubuntu 10.10. Today we're looking at the Grub2 bootloader, and um, we want to see how it works with uh, multiple operating systems. So in this case, I've configured a triple boot on an inexpensive laptop. It's a Toshiba Satellite. Um, it's about a $500 laptop, um, i3 processor, 4 gigs of RAM. So not that sophisticated. Um, and the three operating systems we have installed on it are um, the, the on the very first partition is Snow Leopard, okay, and, um, and not not really a Macintosh here. It's a PC, so it's sort of a Hackintosh. But that's the first partition, and then the next two partitions are Windows 7, um, a system partition about 100 megabytes, and an NTFS partition for the operating system, and then the last two partitions set up are an EXT4 partition for Ubuntu 10.10 Maverick Meerkat and the swap partition that Linux needs. Um, so let's take a look at how Grub2 works with the boot menu and multiple operating systems and we'll just boot into each one real quick and test them out. So I'm going to go into Ubuntu. Okay, this is just Maverick Meerkat. Um, okay, and the next one we want to test is uh, Windows 7.
And now we've logged into Windows 7. And finally, uh, let's try Snow Leopard on our Hackintosh. And now we're booting into uh, Snow Leopard, our OS 10.6, the world's most advanced operating system. Ta da! And this is our third operating system. In addition, there's also a data partition. Um, you know, some of these are logical DOS drives on an extended partition. So a few operating systems and a data partition, but and um, this is Snow Leopard, and you know, every standard fare, Safari, and my obligatory Owl City FLV or video. Well, instead, I get advertising. Instead, I'll do the human league here. Obligatory human league video. Anyway, standard fare. Let's take a look at the Grub2 bootloader's configuration files. Okay, let's open up a terminal and we'll look at some of the Grub2 configuration files. And things have changed considerably since uh, Grub1, or what many people call Legacy Grub. The files are not the same names, the files are not in the same place, but the structure is, is very different from Legacy Grub. Um, so even if you're used to, you know, the, the first version of Grub, you may find this one very different. Boot Grub contains some of the main configuration files. Uh, and I'm going to go into Boot. And I'm going to go into a subdirectory called Grub. I'm just going to list some of the files here. But in the legacy Grub, you used to have a menu.list file. And that menu.list file is no longer here. Okay, it's been uh, moved. Boot Grub Grub CFG is the main configuration file, but it should not be edited manually. Instead, you will edit configuration files in the etc folder and use the command update grub to compile changes to boot grub grub CFG. What you have instead, um, I'll cat it, is a grub.cfg file. Okay. And although you could edit this in a text editor, you're not supposed to. Um, you know, the idea behind Grub2 is that you should never edit this file directly. I'm not saying you couldn't, I'm just saying you shouldn't. Instead, what you want to do, let me recurse up here and go back. It's the default Grub is one of the main files you will actually edit. Um, and then in the etc default directory, if I go to cd etc default, um, in this directory there's a file that I want to edit and it's just called Grub. And that's sort of the default or one of the main configuration files. And what happens is you'll edit these other files. And then when you do it, you'll use a command update grub. And it pretty much just calls make file. And it will take all of this information and compile it into um, the grub.cfg file in the boot grub folder. But you know the way that it's intended that you modify boot menu entries under grub2 is that you modify these other files and that you leave the boot grub grub.cfg file alone because that that will be written to by the scripts um and and things from all of the modifications that you make to the other files